been in, the, uh, Kyoto has been there, global emissions have been going up. Okay, now, we come to the effects of the economic crisis on climate politics. And that is a complicated and a two-sided thing. Because first of all, the effects of the economic crisis on the mainstream of the climate movement have been really quite demoralizing. It isn't simply that NGOs are losing jobs all over the place, it's been ideologically very demoralizing. Because the dominant ideas in the climate movement have been two, really, two kinds of solutions. One is market solutions, and one is individual sacrifice solutions. Market solutions, the argument against market solutions has always been that a regulation, a law, is always better than a market solution. You can put a congestion charge on cars and reduce traffic by 10% in, in central London. You ban cars, you reduce them by 100%. You put a tax on coal, you reduce it slightly, you ban coal, you don't use the stuff. Always the market solution is not as good. But now, the market solutions don't work for the market. <laughs> Why the hell would they work for anything else? Do you know what I mean? So there's deep demoralization among the people who propose market, so market solutions. Also, this, it's becoming very difficult to argue for individual sacrifice in a world where sacrifice is coming all our ways. Where some people in some parts of the world are going to make the final sacrifice in very large numbers. It was always difficult to argue for individual sacrifice and individual lifestyles because everybody always knew that you, you know that to change this we have to change what the whole of the Chinese peasantry and working class does. We have to change what the American working class does. We have to change what all the peasants and workers in India do. We have to change that if we're to do something about climate change. And everybody knows that those people are not going to be persuaded to sacrifice. And God knows in India and China they have sacrificed enough for long enough. And in fact, everybody I know who's argued for a change of lifestyle to individual sacrifice always tells me within two minutes of telling me that that most people even in Britain won't do it because they're selfish. It's an argument, it's an ar it's the people who, who argue for the lifestyle change, they do it because they think they can't change what the government does. So they have to make a personal statement, but nobody thinks it's going to change anything. But again, that argument is now more demoralized because of the economic crisis. Now that's not simply a good thing because those have been the dominant ideas across the environmental movement and that means that they, as, as those ideas are, are bleeding, are not working, the people who are arguing for them are feeling more and more demoralized and you can feel the, you can feel the air going out of them as you listen to them speaking on public platforms and so on. There's a crisis of confidence and because that's the majority part of the environmental movement there is a general problem of confidence. But on the other hand, the argument for a socialist solution, the argument for green jobs, the argument for climate jobs is now exploding. Because it makes sense. In a way it didn't a year ago, it now makes sense to very large numbers of people. First of all, up to a year ago, whenever I gave a talk like this, I'd go into the toilet before the talk and I'd do my mask again on the, you know, the little back of the envelope stuff where I figure, that the amount of green jobs we need to really make a difference fast in this country probably costs about 45 billion pounds a year. And I would think, can I say anything as crazy as 45 billion pounds a year to these people? Well, they're revolutionary socialists, they'll tolerate almost any level of craziness, so I'll say it. <laughs> but now, 45 billion pounds a year? They can find 400 billion pounds for the banks by 11.30 on Tuesday morning if they have to, and we all know it. So that, the argument that you can't spend the money has gone. But also, we face green shoots of, I don't believe in green shoots of recovery at the moment. I don't know the scale or the length of the downturn, but I think it's going to be severe and I think what we're facing is what they called in America after the last boom, the jobless recovery. 
because uh, every green shoot they have is still we're losing jobs. It's that profits might go up a bit. In this situation, there is going to be enormous pressure, enormous pressure for jobs for our class, for the jobs we are losing, for jobs that are worth something for jobs that we are paid a decent wage for, um, but also for an expansion to the economy. Because they are telling us, the Tories and Labour are telling us, that there will have to be massive cuts in public expenditure and capital expenditure in the middle of a recession, in the middle of mass unemployment. This is the politics of the Weimar Republic, of, uh, of Ramsey MacDonald, of Herbert Hoover in the, uh, in the last recession. This is the politics of disaster. So, the, the, so we have an opportunity to argue for our class for a massive expansion in jobs, and there is a resonance for that that there has not been, been since. The last thing, though, is that the rulers of the world will say, well, yes, you can read it all the time in the Financial Times and the New York Times and so on. You can read them saying, yes, we do have to do massive things about the climate, but unfortunately, we already spent all the money. We already gave it to the bankers. And what we have to say to that, I mean, it's real simple. Take it back from the bankers. <laughs> but also, every bit of investment we're talking about is investment that saves money and makes returns in the long time. In the long term, we're talking about train journeys. We're talking uh, about saving on insulating of houses. We're talking about producing electricity. We're talking about stuff for which we and our children and our grandchildren will get, will get revenue back. So now it is possible to argue for it. And I don't just mean abstractly, I mean concretely. In this country, we've got an alliance now between the PCS, for those of you not from Britain, the Civil Servants Union, the CWU, the Post Office, uh, the Post Office Union, the RMT, the, and the TSSA, the railway unions, the UCU, the lecturers union, and we're getting other unions on board with the campaign against climate change and a bunch of academics. What we're doing is producing a report that we can sell to workers all over the country in tens of thousands. A report with a detailed plan for a million climate jobs in this country. We'll have it out by the end of, uh, by the end of October, but the point in doing that isn't to have another NGO plan, it isn't to have another alternative plan for what socialists would do if only socialists ruled the world. Do you know what I mean? It's not for that. It's a plan we want to fight for in the here and now to make the government do it. Whatever government we have, to make them do it. And we will do that by getting every union branch we can to support it, by going and getting it, surrounding the council meetings and getting them to support it, making the mayors support it, getting the churches to support it, getting every NGO we can to support it, giving it getting every school assembly we can to support it, taking it to every bit of society so that we build up a force where we can either talk about what we would have to do to make the government do this. It will take strike action. It will take strike action across the country to actually make the government do it. But to talk about that now, I'm just warning you, talk about it now is abstract, abstract to talk about it until you have the, uh, until you have the mass, um, until you have a mass campaign running. But the other thing we do with that plan is that we've got it there, we've got lots of the unions and everybody else supporting it, and then when a bunch of workers come out and strike because their, their plant's being closed down because it doesn't work in this economy, they occupy the plant, and instead of saying what they're already saying, which is wouldn't it be good if we could make something else with our plastics, they say the government has to fund us to make page 26, line 7 of this plan. That's what we are going to make. It would have made, the, when the Hoover factory closed down in South Wales where I was living, they were making washing machines. They, they, they went. They didn't have the, they didn't have the ideological backing to fight. If they had been able to say, what we're going to do is make the washing machines that use a quarter <laughs> of the electricity <laughs> that all of the washing machines make now, and the government is going to make it compulsory that you can only buy washing machines that use a quarter of the electricity, <laughs> and that everybody has to make them. If we had that, 